This morning we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 26. Luke 11, I say 11 through 26, verse, Luke chapter 11, verses 14 through 26, if I can read my notes. So Luke 11, Luke 11, 14 through 26. Now in this text, Jesus is going to deal with some people who outright blaspheme him, something that still continues today. He's going to respond to skeptics, cynics, doubters, but then he's going to issue two warnings that we today still need to heed. And so, we're going to be in Luke 11, verses 14 through 26. Before I read this text, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we read this word that you have given us, I pray that you will open up our hearts and our minds and our ears to what is in your word. Heavenly Father, renew us, convict us, transform us through your word as we read it and as we learn from it. And I pray that you are glorified in the reading of your word. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Beginning in verse 14, Luke writes, Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. The he here is Jesus. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, He cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. While others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. If I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when a stronger than he, but when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. And finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So here we have Jesus dealing with those who are dismissing him, doubting him, questioning him, and outright blaspheming him. And he responds to them, and then he issues two warnings. So let's take a look at those. Beginning in verses 14 through 20, Jesus responds to those who blaspheme him. Now, let's just go through this little story, this encounter a little bit. Verse 14 sets up the scene. Jesus was casting out a demon, and after the demon's cast out, verse 14, the people marveled. Pretty straightforward. Jesus cast out a demon, and the people were amazed at this. However, not everybody was so impressed. And we're going to encounter that in life. We may do the grandest thing, and there's always going to be someone standing back going, yep, and so I don't buy it, whatever. You're always going to have someone. Well, Jesus had a lot of someones. And they responded if, with their doubting and dismissal in a couple of ways. Verses 15 to 16. Ch verse 15, check that out. Some of them said, he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. This is blasphemy. They are saying Jesus is in league with Satan. Jesus is doing this because he's in league with the devil. The devil made him do it. So we should reject him. This is blasphemy. And Jesus does respond directly to it. But then verse 16. So we have the blasphemers. Then in verse 16, while others test him, said... Where there says they were, they were seeking from him a sign from heaven. Basically, they were in denial. Jesus had just performed this miracle. He had just cast out a demon. 
And their answer is, where's the evidence? There's no proof. He's making these claims and, and there, he hasn't proven it, given any, any evidence. So show us a sign, Jesus. Uh, did, did they just not see one? Well, Jesus responds to both of these. However, before we get to the responses, something we need to consider. These two things still occur today. People today outside the church, and sadly, yes, people inside the church, continue to dismiss, deny, and blaspheme our Lord. Now, I saw a video the other day. This lady was at a podcast interview, and the interviewer, the host of the show, asked her, once well, he's outright said, you're not, you're, I don't think you're a Christian, correct? Now, his basis was probably, you probably looked at what she'd said and written and stuff or whatever, and said, you're, you're not a Christian. She said, yes, I am a Christian. Okay, so far so good. He said, oh, do you believe the Bible? No. Yeah, that was their reaction. You're a Christian, but you deny the Bible. Sad truth is, there are a lot of people that will go to church that will say, I'm a Christian. Do you believe what the Bible says? Do you believe in the biblical Jesus? Oh, no. Nope, 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 nope. So how do we deny or dismiss Jesus or even outright blaspheme him? Well, here's some ways that you may see it happening. When we create a Jesus that appeases us, when we create a Jesus that is not offensive, when we create a Jesus that doesn't criticize, when we, create, when we create a Jesus that makes us feel comfortable in our current situation, we are dismissing and denying Jesus. When we create a Jesus, or, or even worse, when we expect Jesus to abide by our commands and do what we say, or we, when we expect Jesus to adhere to our personal values, thus making us his master, then we have denied, dismissed, and possibly even blasphemed Jesus. When we look at the evidence in the Bible and look at the claims, and by the way, guys and gals, there are preachers, some big-name preachers, and I normally wouldn't mention names I'm going to in this case, because his father recently passed away. His father, Charles Stanley, great preacher. Andy Stanley is one of these, who looks at the Bible and says, yeah, it's myth. I reject it. We can ignore it. It didn't really happen. There's no evidence for any of this. When we do that, and we reject some or all of Scripture, as many people do, then we are denying, dismissing, and possibly even, even blaspheming Jesus. Ultimately, all of these are about rejection of the biblical Jesus. Who is the biblical Jesus? The biblical Jesus points out sin. Oh, we don't like that. It's uncomfortable. The biblical Jesus calls us to repent of our sin. Oh, we don't want to do that because that means we have to admit we have sin. And what if someone finds out? The biblical Jesus demands that we submit to Him. Yet, how often do we deny that? Say, no, I know what He says, but I'm not going to do it. I know what the Word of God says, but I'm not going to accept it. I just can't go that with that. I know, what, I know it says this is true, but I just can't, can't believe that. I can't accept that. Who's God? You or Jesus? Well, Jesus responds to his critics, and he responds to both the blasphemy and the denial. Verses 17 to 18 and verse 19, we see the, that he responds to the blasphemy in a couple of ways. Check out verses 17 and 18. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. We've all heard the phrase, a divided house cannot stand, or a house divided cannot stand. We've heard that phrase. And Jesus tells them this, and 
basically, it's kind of a given. Well, duh, of course, a house against itself is not going to stand. And so, if Jesus is working with the devil to cast out demons, we have Satan opposing Satan, and that's just, that doesn't work. It's kind of, and the people would be like, well, yeah, true, okay, yeah, true. So basically what he tells them is this. Your accusation of blasphemy that I'm working for the devil, it's illogical. It doesn't make sense. It cannot exist. So, yeah, it's, it's a false claim. Jesus is not working for the devil. Well, he also responds to them in verse 19. If Satan also... Uh, I'm sorry, uh... No, not with it, just with it logic and looking at my notes and back and forth. Yeah, uh, Satan also divided against himself. Verse 19, if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? So not only is their blasphemy illogical, here he references something that we see in Acts chapter 19. There were a lot of Jewish students that would go out and try to cast out demons. That was a common practice. Now, they wouldn't preach the gospel. They'd just simply try to cast out the demons. However, what Jesus points out is, hey guys, you're telling me who's casting out a demon that I'm working for the devil, but your own students over there are casting out demons, and you look at them and say they're serving God. So your accusation is actually hypocritical. Because your own people, <laughs> your own students are doing things, and you're going, yay, serving God, I'm doing things, and you're going, ew, evil. You're a hypocrite. And the fact that you won't condemn them because they're not doing anything bad is evidence of your own hypocrisy. So blasphemy is a ludicrous claim because the fact is Jesus is not serving the devil. He's serving God the Father. But then he turns in verse 20 to the second issue. So he dealt with blasphemy. Now he deals with the denial. Verse 20, he says, But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, in the Greek structure, we, in English we have the word if. If this is true, and that means it might be true, it might not be true. In the Greek structure here, what this means is, yeah, it is true. In other words, hey guys, I'm clearly not working for the devil. The fact is, I'm working for the Father. And because I'm working for the Father and doing His will and using the power that is divine, guess what? The kingdom of God is here with you. So you want evidence of the kingdom? It's right there. To put it simply, what Jesus is saying is this. Hey guys, you want evidence that, that, that I'm the Messiah? You want evidence I'm working for God? Did you not see the, the exorcism? Is right there. And you just refuse to admit it. And there are a lot of people today who will say, where is the evidence for God? Where is the evidence that Jesus was Messiah? Where is the evidence for this claim? Where is the evidence for that claim? And you show them this evidence, that evidence, this other evidence, make all the proof available, and they go, "There's no, that's not proof. It's like a guy standing on the highway and vehicles are coming at him, and you say, there's cars coming, get out of the way. I don't see cars. Do you not see the vehicle? Rolling down the road, straight at you, honking his horn, flashing his lights. I don't accept that evidence. You're a fool. Well, the people that deny the evidence of Scripture are fools. They say, where's the proof? It's right in front of them. Jesus had just performed this miracle, and they, their answer is, uh... We don't see it. We don't see it. Really? They're not looking for evidence for the claim. They're trying to make excuses to justify their disbelief. So, Jesus has responded to his critics. He's responded to the blasphemy. He's responded to the denial, saying, I'm serving God. The evidence is right in front of your eyes. So let me issue two warnings. And we begin with the first warning in verses 21 to 23 where Jesus warns people who reject him. What's he say? 
Verse 21, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. I want to pause there. Who is this strong man? This strong man is the devil, Satan. Satan is armed and defending what he owns. What does he own? The fallen world. However, along comes another guy, verse 22. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, so who is this stronger one? Jesus. As strong as the devil may be, Jesus is infinitely stronger. And so what does this stronger one do? What does Jesus do? He comes in. Now check this out. Comes in. He attacks him. He overcomes him. He takes away his armor, in which Satan trusted, and divides his spoil. In other words, utter, absolute, total defeat. Oh yeah, that's how strong Satan is compared to Jesus. Jesus is the absolute victor over evil. Jesus is the absolute victor over Satan. Jesus is absolutely full of power and authority over those things. And he's going, and he has utterly defeated Satan. And so we get to verse 23. In light of the fact that there's two parties involved here, the strong one, Satan, and the stronger one, the victor, Jesus, those are the only two options. Here's the warning, verse 23. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather, scatters. In other words, there's only two options in this life. You are either following Jesus or you're serving Satan. There is no middle ground. There are no neutral parties. Life is not saying, hmm, I am in neither camp. I'm going to pick which side I want. No, there is no such thing as an independent voter here. You're either following Jesus or serving Satan. One of the two. You're either trusting in the victor or you're following the loser who's already been defeated. And so the only means of protection and victory from Satan and evil is Jesus himself. Without faith in Jesus Christ, there is no protection, there is no assurance, there is no hope, and there's no victory. If you want victory in your life spiritually, if you want to have victory over evil Put your faith in Christ Jesus. There are many people today, many of them who say they're Christians, who will do things to try to protect themselves from evil spirits. They'll put up crosses or wear talismans. They will say special prayers or incantations. They will use the right jewelry and the right religious paraphernalia to to do the right things to give them protection. They might say, if I do enough good works, I'm protected. Well, I've got bad news for you. Special prayers will not protect you. The cross is hanging on your wall will do nothing for you. The things that you wear, jewelry or whatever, will do nothing for you. Your good works can do nothing to protect you. The only protection from Satan and evil is faith in Jesus Christ alone because He is the victor. Are we following the victor or are we following the loser? So you may be wondering, 
How do I know in my life? How can I tell if I'm following Satan or if I'm following the devil? Ask yourself this question. Think about the choices you make each day. And ask yourself, based upon the choices that you have made or that you are making, do you serve yourself or do you serve your Savior? What do your choices say the answer is? But now we move on to the second of the two warnings, verses 24 to 26. Jesus has responded to his critics. He has warned people about rejecting him. And now he warns against false righteousness. Because there's going to be people to say, well, I'm okay, I'm good and holy, I'm in, I'm in good shape, yeah. Let's, let's, let's check on that. Verses 24 to 26. What does it say? Jesus tells this little, not really parable, but illustrative story, I guess you could say. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. And finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. I want to stop there. These verses, these three verses, deal with a couple of issues. One's a, a, a minor issue, but it's, I need, it's worth mentioning. The other one's the big point. So let's deal with the minor issue first. And that minor issue is a little bit about demonology. Now, part of the reason I want to mention this is because I believe it was last month or in May, there was a group that was in Corpus Christi of deliverance ministers. And they like to raise the question that many Christians do ask today. Can a Christian be possessed or inhabited by a demon? And these Deliverance ministers will say, yes. Scripture, however, says no. Without getting into too much detail, I'll just simply su uh, summarize it this way. The only people who can be possessed or inhabited by a demon are non-believers. Someone who is a born-again Christian, that is, they have repented of their sins, they believe in Jesus Christ alone, and when that happens, you are filled with the Holy Spirit, that person cannot be possessed or inhabited by a demon, but you can be tempted by them. So, if someone says a Christian can be possessed, no, sorry. Scripture says otherwise. But what's the larger point here? The larger point is the false righteousness that people deal with. So, let's take a look at it. Before we do, a couple terms we need to define to help us understand. Verse 24. He says, the unclean spirit's gone out, and toward the end of it, he says, I'll return to my house. And we need to understand this term to understand this point Jesus, that Jesus is making. Larger point. The house is the person. So, the house in view here is the individual. But then in verse 25, toward the end of it, it says that the house is swept and put in order. And that sounds good. So what's that mean? What that means is, with the demon out, things look okay, things seem okay, but there's no resident there. No one's living in that house. Now we have to understand that in order to understand what Jesus is getting at. So the house of the person, swept and put in order, means things seem okay, but... It's, there's nothing there. It's just an empty building or empty house, you could say. So, let's go through this story. Verse 24, the spirit is cast out. The evil is gone. It's been cast out and it's now having to look for a new place to live, right? And the person who had the demon in them, who had the evil in them, is going, hey, things are fixed, things are okay. And this is what often happened with the Jewish exorcist. They would cast out the demon stop there, but they cast out the demon and that's it. And they'd probably believe or tell the person, hey, you're all healed. It's all good. The evil's gone. And a lot of people today, when that evil, when that bad thing, that, that thing that is holding them down is gone, they think things are okay. I'm in good shape. 
The house is clean and put in order, but it's empty. And when there's an empty house, something or someone is going to live there. Now, the question is who or what? Well, there's only two options. Either the Holy Spirit is going to live in that house. Now, how does that happen? The way the Holy Spirit comes to live in that house is when the gospel is preached to them. That is absolutely vital. That's what the Jewish exorcists forgot. You've got to preach the gospel of Christ crucified for sin, resurrected for new life. And when the person repents of their sin and believes in Jesus alone, the Holy Spirit is given to them and the Holy Spirit moves in. And by the way, remember, God is victor. Satan cannot overcome God. And so if the Holy Spirit's living there, <laughs> that's permanent. The devil cannot move in because there's a new resident in town and his name is the Holy Spirit. So, the Holy Spirit moves in through gospel preaching, repentance, believing in Jesus. But if the Holy Spirit isn't living there, the other option is the demon returns. And if he comes back, he's coming back with his friends and they're worse than him. One of the two is going to live there. And by the way, check this out. We know this because Jesus uses this phrase intentionally. He says the demon will say, I will return to, what's he say? My house. The demon's out of the person, but he still calls it his house. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's not living there. The demon still owns that house. He can move back in any time. And if he does, he's bringing his friends. And if you don't want the demon in there, if you don't want the evil in there, turn to Jesus Christ. He's the only hope. So, we get to the end of it. The last sentence, at least it's, it's his own sentence in ESV. Jesus says, and the last state, this is if after the demon comes back in, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. And it's not dealing with, not talking about just because there's more demons in there. This is in the context of the house that has been set in order, and it's all good and hunky-dory, and it's not really. It just looks that way. What Jesus is saying is this. You think you're righteous, you think you're okay, but if you don't have the Holy Spirit, guess what? You're not okay. And there are a lot of people outside the church and there are a lot of people inside the church who have this misconception that being moral is the same as being righteous. They're not. A lot of Christians walk in the doors of a church and put on a fake front. They act all righteous. Everything's okay. But inside, they are doubting Jesus. Inside, they're denying Jesus. Inside, they're rebelling against Jesus. In their minds, they're refusing to submit. In their minds, they're refusing to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord and God. Oh, but everything's okay on the outside. It's a false righteousness. And just because someone looks moral or acts moral doesn't mean they are righteous in the eyes of God. Something we need to keep in mind. Morals change all the time in the world. Emphasis in the world. What was immoral, unfathomable, detestable five years ago, ten years ago, fifty years ago is now considered normal acceptable, and celebrated. Morals in the world have changed. And if we don't have a solid basis for our morals, for our righteousness, then our morals will be defined by what's in the world, and that will change. And what will happen? As Jesus said, the person will be worse off than they were before. Why? Because now that which was hated before, will now be accepted and celebrated, and they'll be doing even more immoral things than maybe even in the name of God. Talk about other churches who have changed their views on all kinds of issues. 
because it's acceptable or whatever. They're getting their values not from the Gospel, not from Scripture, but from themselves and the fallen world. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's not living there. The Holy Spirit ain't living there. We need the Holy Spirit in us to avoid a false righteousness. So our only protection against a false righteousness is Christ alone. The Gospel must be proclaimed. The Gospel must be learned. And the Gospel must be lived. Jesus must be trusted. Jesus must be obeyed. Jesus must be served. Are we doing that? So, the question is, how do we recognize false righteousness versus true righteousness? How do we know which one we're putting on? Well, here's some ways. When we associate being moral with being Christian and righteous, that's a false righteousness. There are many, many, many moral atheists who despite their morality are going to hell. Another way, and this one's extremely common in churches, kind of like I said, coming to church and acting all holy and righteous, putting on a false front, a mask, trying to make things look good, but on the inside denying Jesus. Think about it this way. It's like going to a dumpster full of trash, smelly, stinky, taking a power washer to it, washing that exterior, cleaning off that lid, making it nice and bright, shiny, giving it a new paint job. You've got the best looking dumpster in the town. Nothing is as clean and good as it but it's full of trash and smelly. When we try to act good, but have no faith in Jesus, are not submitting to Jesus, are not serving Jesus, and are putting ourselves first, then we are that smelly dumpster no matter how pretty we, we look on the outside. I'd rather have someone admit that they're the dumpster that needs help than have someone that presents themselves as a polished item that is broken and they're hiding it. Looking good and being good are not the same. But when we conflate them, it's false righteousness. So what is true righteousness? What does that look like? True righteousness is deeply lamenting and fervently repenting of our sins. How many of us have watched a TV show or a movie and cried when our favorite character suffers a tragedy? And yet when we look at our own depravity, we go, yeah, that's okay. Not a big deal. When we're more heartbroken over a fictional character's suffering than over our own sin, there's a problem. True righteousness is broken over our own depravity and repents of it. True righteousness puts faith in Jesus Christ because of His sacrifice on the cross for sin so that all who repent and believe are saved. True righteousness says, I trust in Him, not myself. I trust in Him, not my works. I trust in Him, and I'm going to serve Him, and I will not serve the devil. Why? Because He's Jesus. True righteousness submits daily to the Word of God, even if it makes us personally uncomfortable. You may have heard people say, well, I know that the Bible says this or that, but I just can't accept that. 
Well, I know the Bible says I need to do this or that or believe this or that, but I have a different belief. I just can't, I just can't accept what the Bible says. Who's God, you or the author of this? True righteousness submits to the Word of God daily. Or to put it simply, to summarize everything, true righteousness knows the gospel of Jesus. True righteousness shows the gospel of Jesus. And true righteousness shares the gospel of Jesus. Not just in church, but in our homes and in our workplaces and in our schools and among our friends. When we're out at the stores, showing love to others, and when the chance comes, looking for them, share the good news. That is what true righteousness looks like. So, all of this to be said, what are we to do with this? Well, I want to ask, go back to a question I asked earlier. That really helps us heed Jesus' warnings about rejecting him and about our own righteousness. First question, the one I asked earlier, are you following yourself or are you following the Savior? When you have an opportunity to serve God in some capacity, do you take that opportunity because it's going to glorify God and you want to show Him your love? Or do you refrain because it's not convenient or something you don't want to do or it requires too much time? Are you seeking your own personal morality in life? Or are you seeking the righteousness of Christ through repentance, faith, and living out what we profess? Or do very put it very, very simply this way, a thing that's been popular at least 10 years now. Are you here seeking, or in life, are you seeking your own personal truth? Or are you seeking the one who is the truth? The answer to these questions will tell you where you stand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Oh,